Thanks very much, David. Um, so, good evening, everyone, and uh, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here tonight and uh, give this talk on marine mammals. Uh, and thank you all for choosing to come here and spend your Thursday evening here at Moston. So, as David mentioned, I'm a lecturer in the School of Ocean Sciences at Bangor University, and I'm a population ecologist by training. So. I'm particularly interested in understanding why populations fluctuate over time and what the drivers are uh, of these fluctuations. And this has involved uh, research on a wide variety of different species, um, but I guess the common thread uh, through my research over the last 10 years has been marine mammals. So they seem to be the ones that I keep coming back to. And this evening I've chosen to talk about the acoustic world that they live in. Um, so I want to start off by, if we can all imagine what it's like when we go snorkeling or diving, uh, the sensory modality that we depend most on, which is vision, uh, underwater this becomes very restrictive and we really can't see very far at all. Maybe a metre to a hundred metres depending on the clarity of the water. In contrast, uh, sound travels very well underwater uh, and that's uh, uh, because sound travels about five times faster underwater than it does in air. So in air, the speed of sound is about 340 meters per second, but underwater, uh, it's 1500 meters per second. So sound can cover vast distances in the oceans, easily uh, tens to hundreds of kilometers, um, uh, depending on the properties of that sound. So hearing rather than vision is really the, the optimal sensory modality underwater. Um, but we're a very visual species as humans, so it's quite difficult for us to fully understand how these aquatic species uh, live and communicate. And it's made even harder by the fact that you'll probably have noticed if you're snorkeling or diving that we don't hear very well underwater either. Uh, so sounds become very muffled. We have very poor sensitivity. And we've also got very poor directional hearing, and that's because um, our auditory organs uh, are still connected to the skull uh, to some extent. So uh, sound, um, the direction of sounds uh, um, also become quite muffled because of uh, bone conductivity. And other species that are more adapted to this environment have auditory organs that are isolated from the skull. Uh, so they have very highly specialized and directional hearing. So just to uh, illustrate, that's very bright all of a sudden, um, the potential for sound travel underwater. So in uh, 1991, I believe it is, uh, coded acoustic signals were transmitted from down here near Heard Island in the Southern Indian Ocean. And these signals were listened for at different stations across all the major oceans. And this study showed that low frequency sound can travel thousands of kilometers uh, underwater in a relatively short period of time. So these acoustic signals transmitted from Heard Island traveled uh, 16,000 kilometers approximately and reached the coasts, both the east and west coast of North America in around about three hours. So, you know, quite quick uh, for such a long distance and quite amazing that these sounds were still picked up at such great distances. So as sound travels much better uh, in water than light, many marine animals, including marine mammals, use uh, hearing and sound production to uh, gain information about their environment and to communicate with conspecifics. So cetaceans, which are the whales, dolphins and porpoises in particular, are heavily dependent on sound for uh, communication, for socializing with each other, finding mates, uh, finding food, and for navigating in the underwater world, as well as avoiding predators. So sound really serves quite a critical function for these animals. Um, and all marine mammals use sound to uh, stay in touch with one another. And they've evolved these abilities or this ability over tens of millions of years, uh, ways in which to depend on sound to explore uh, their world, and as well as to stay in touch with one another. 
So uh, for whales, dolphins and porpoises, I uh, just want to highlight before uh, we go on that we've got two major groups that are quite distinct. So we've got the, uh, the uh, whales and dolphins that have teeth. So these are the ones on the left hand side of the screen for you, uh, including the killer whale, which is the largest of the dolphin, uh, the sperm whale, which is the largest toothed whale, as well as all species of dolphins and porpoises. And we've also, the other group uh, are those uh, whales that have uh, baleen rather than teeth. And these include all the great whales. So we've got the humpback whale at the top, uh, the right whale, and the, uh, the largest mammal on earth, the blue whale down at the bottom. So the baleen whales, um, are less social, uh, often solitary animals, although they do form some loose aggregations at certain times of year. Uh, they produce very low frequency sounds or calls because these calls need to travel great distances underwater to reach conspecifics. In contrast, the toothed whales uh, over the other side of the screen tend to be more social, forming uh, very structured aggregations. And they, in contrast to the baleen whales, produce quite high frequency sounds that are uh, very complex in nature um, and high frequency because these sounds don't need to travel very far to reach group members. So for the next few slides, I'm going to talk about or touch on a few of the toothed whales that live in quite intriguing uh, social societies and how sound plays uh, quite a key role in their day-to-day -day lives for both coordinating group behavior uh, and for communicating with one another. So communication with conspecifics uh, forms a key aspect of um, the lives of these very social species. So the first one I wanna flag up is uh, bottlenose dolphins. It's probably the most or one of the most iconic of the marine mammals. And they live in probably the most complex societies as well, containing quite uh, intricate and shifting social relationships. And these are referred to as fish and fusion societies. So individuals will associate with one another in small groups, but these groups change in composition on a regular basis. So uh, on a daily basis or even sometimes an hourly basis, depending on who's available. And there's great parallels between uh, these fish and fusion societies of dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, and those of chimpanzees. So I know we, for us humans, the family is probably the most important to us. But if we leave the family out of it and then think of our network of friends, there's probably some friends that we like more than others. There's probably also some that we like to uh, spend time with under certain uh, situations <laughs> rather than others. And it's a similar analogy for uh, these dolphin societies. So this here is an example of a, a social network where each of these dots are, is, uh, represents an individual and all these connecting lines represents uh, a relationship or an association with another individual. So, and within these societies, there are also quite stark differences between males and females in how they uh, socialize. Some females tend to be highly social. So we've got this individual here and that individual there, uh, which are highly social. They've got a lot of uh, connecting lines, so quite a broad uh, social network compared to others uh, like this animal here and this animal, which associate, associate themselves with relatively few individuals. Uh, and the composition of these associations between, between females are also highly variable. On the other hand, males uh, form alliances with other males, and they do this in order to consort females. And these bonds in males can be extremely strong and much more stable than those of females. And it's been shown that the bigger the male alliance, the higher their reproductive success. Uh, and this uh, complex uh, social organization in dolphin societies really requires quite advanced uh, communication. And dolphins make a wide variety of sounds uh, one of which is a whistle. But before I move on to talking about dolphin whistles, I just want to play uh, a sound here so you can hear 
what dolphins sound like in their day-to-day -day lives. So you can hear some clicks in the background as well, very clear whistles and squeaks. Uh, so quite complicated, quite varied uh, repertoire. But one of the main sounds that dolphins make is a whistle. And uh, specific whistles are um, individually distinctive and they are thought to broadcast the identity of the caller. And these particular whistles are called signature whistles. And they're quite harmonic uh, in their sounds. So we can listen to an example here of a signature whistle. So some upsweeps, very clear upsweeps in that signature whistle. There are other animals that have signature, individually distinctive signature calls. One is the rhesus monkey uh, on the right hand side of this figure. And these are examples of rhesus uh, monkey uh, individual calls. And as you can see here, uh, these are different individuals. Uh, they're quite similar between individuals and they're also quite simple in, or relatively simple in the structure. Particularly when you compare it to the signature whistles of bottlenose dolphins, there's a lot of variation between individuals uh, and the calls themselves also quite complex. Um, so if we think about uh, a signature whistle, it's sort of the same thing as if we were to repeat our name over and over and over again. Uh, and sometimes they also copy uh, their mates within the group. So if we sometimes copied the name of our friend sitting on the other side of the room, for us that would become quite annoying uh, quite quickly <laughs> because we can also see each other. So there's no need for it really. But in the underwater world, it's a, a very useful way of staying in touch with one another. And uh, individual calves develop their signature whistles within the first three months of their lives uh, and it's thought that they model their whistles based on another group member and then modify it to come up with their own unique uh, sound. So they don't necessarily interestingly model it after their mothers, although when they do it tends to be male calves that do so rather than females. Uh, so this study here showed the uh, importance of signature whistles to mothers and calves of bottlenose dolphins. So you can see when the mother and calf were in close proximity of less than 20 meters, they, uh, they um, used these signature whistles about 40% of the time compared to when the mother and calf were separated by more than 100 meters, they used these signature whistles all of the time, so 100% of the time. I just want to uh, highlight this is a little bit of an aside, but I find it quite intriguing. Uh, so very few non-human animals can imitate sound, um, although it is thought to be quite widespread in birds. It's relatively uh, rare in mammals. Uh, so it's a very rare ability to be able to change what you say based on what you hear. But we have a few examples of marine mammals being able to mimic the sounds of other species. And in this example here, um, there was uh, bottlenose dolphins again in captivity that were shown to be able to mimic the sound of the trainer's whistle. So this here is an example of uh, what the trainer's uh, whistle would sound like, so quite a flat tone, so toot. Um, and dolphins uh, in the center were shown to be able to mimic that sound of the trainer's whistle. So you can see those quite flat tones in the uh, dolphin's whistle. We've got other examples of well, as well of uh, killer whales being able to mimic the barks of uh, sea lions. And I think the, the most intriguing example is that of beluga whales or white whales. Uh, they've been shown to be able to mimic human speech. Um, so it took the staff quite a while at the center where this occurred to actually figure out what was happening and that it was the whale making these sounds. So they kept looking around for uh, other people uh, that might be, be speaking at the time. So quite incredible abilities and these are some of the examples of the highest forms of social learning. And uh, Professor Peter Tayak, who studied the acoustics of marine mammals throughout his career, I believe, he made the very uh, clever analogy that uh, some of you probably have pets, uh, that we should all be uh, very surprised if we uh, suddenly experienced our dog or our cat mimicking any sound that we made.
So uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about uh, killer whales, which also live in quite intriguing uh, social societies. Killer whales, rather than fish infusion societies, live in very stable uh, matrilineal units. Uh, so that means they live in units that consist of um, females and their offspring and their offspring's offspring. And within these matrilineal pods, uh, each pod has its own unique culturally uh, transmitted vocal dialect. So this repetitious call that's shared by all pod members. And this call is um, transferred to between generations. And the calls also uh, persist unchanged for decades. So they're indicators of pod affiliation and they're used in close range communication. And these pods form uh, parts of um, a hierarchical social structure in which pods that share parts of calls uh, are grouped into what's called vocal clans. And uh, clans remain distinctive from each other um, despite uh, overlapping in geographic uh, ranges as well as uh, regularly coming into contact with one another. So on the right here, you've got different pods from A1 to D. And all these pods share uh, some part of their, uh, these repetitious calls. So you've got the similarity of their calls here at the bottom. So C and D here, these pods are very similar in the calls that they make. And these pods are part of the clan A. But as you can see, there's absolutely no overlap or linkage between the, the calls of clan A and those of clan G, for example. Um, and there's an ongoing debate um, about the existence and nature uh, of culture in non-humans uh, and culture being defined as group level information or behavior that's transmitted uh, by social learning. Um, but this debate, as you can probably guess, has recently widened to include uh, cetaceans, so including killer whales in particular. And I've got a call as well of a killer whale. Again, a lot of whistles, clicks, but very different to the bottlenose dolphins. And some chirps as well. quite intriguing sounds and again, quite distinctive uh, from those of uh, the bottlenose. So the last tooth whale uh, I want to talk about is the sperm whale, which also uh, forms quite complex uh, social structures. Uh, and these are called uh, social units and they last over a very long period of time. Um, and similar to the killer whales, uh, sperm whales also form uh, vocal clans. Um, but these units that sperm whales live within consist of about 10 to 12 females and their offspring. So similar structure to that of killer whales, these matrilineal uh, units, although there is some uh, transfer of individuals between units as well. But instead of uh, those more intriguing sounds used by uh, dolphins and killer whales, Sperm whales uh, just depend on clicks. So they use clicks both for foraging, but also for communication. So they can change the rhythmic patterns of these clicks to come up with individual identity coders, they're called. And this is what a click of a sperm whale sounds like. So quite simple sound, but again, uh, they can um, construct quite rhythmic patterns uh, of different numbers of clicks over a varied uh, length of time. So it, again, it allows pod members to stay in touch with one another over long distances, particularly when foraging. So sperm whales is one of the deepest diving marine mammals. They can dive down to uh, often about a kilometer uh, depth and dives can easily last up to or over an hour in duration. 
so you can imagine once you've been down at depth, it's very dark. Uh, it's difficult to keep track of group members. So they use these individual identity coders to keep track of where everyone is. And sperm whales are even more intriguing in that they've been shown to take considerable risk to uh, protect and defend group members when they've been under predatory attack from killer whales. And they also show allomaternal care um, of calves within the group. So that means females will protect and look after calves of other females while they're down foraging. So calves don't have the diving abilities of the adults, so they have to stay at the surface which is very risky, so they're very vulnerable there to attacks of killer whales. But they show this uh, cooperative care. So lastly, um, for the toothed whales, um, I just want to mention that uh, all these animals of toothed whales also use echolocation. And this is a very specialized form of acoustic communication where the animal is essentially sending sound um, or sending information to itself. So they are essentially hear, um, seeing using sound. And echolocation has evolved independently in five different mammalian lineages, including bats, as shown here, but also in shrews, uh, golden hamsters, flying lemurs, um, and some marine mammals as well. So bats, as you can see in this example here, are, are using echolocation to hone in on moths, which they like to feed on, but interestingly, uh, moths have uh, adapted through co-evolution to uh, being able to jam up the echolocation signal of bats. So uh, in response to these sonar-guided attacking bats, some tiger moths can produce their own uh, ultrasonic clicks, which jam up the signal of the bat. So a very clever uh, system. So it was demonstrated, echolocation was demonstrated in bats in 1938, but it took another 25 years before we demonstrated it in toothed whales or in dolphins. Um, so dolphins and toothed whales use uh, echolocation. Um, they produce very loud clicks and then they listen uh, for the echoes, uh, either from the seafloor in order to orient themselves or from prey such as fish in order to figure out where food is. And how does it work? Uh, when the dolphin is at the surface, it takes a deep breath and then the blowhole up there at the top of the head uh, shuts tightly. And air is then moved uh, through the nasal passages down to the lungs. And the engine that drives sound production in these animals is the larynx. Uh, so the larynx forces air upwards and the air is uh, move through uh, these two uh, or these twin passages in the skull and in each of these twin passages uh, there are uh, a set of flaps called the phonic lips also called the monkey lips in uh, sperm whales because that's what they look like in that species and it's the rapid vibrations of these flaps, flaps that uh, produce the echolocation clicks um, and dolphins have been shown to be able to produce uh, 2,000 uh, echolocation clicks per second. So that's quite staggering. And it's a very efficient system. Once the air is moved past the phonic lips, it can be recycled over and over again to produce new um, cycles of echolocation clicks. And the clicks are, um, or sound is produced through or transmitted through the melon, which is this organ that sits at the front of the skull. Um, and this focuses and directs the clicks uh, forward. They're highly directional, so uh, just a couple of uh, degrees. Uh, so this melon actually acts as an acoustic lens. Interestingly, in toothed whales, their ear canals are uh, very, very narrow, and there's uh, some, um, what's it called? There's some doubt around whether they're actually functional. And in the baleen whales, their ear canals are essentially plugged with earwax. So recent research showed that uh, these species might actually be hearing through their jaws. So they've got other fatty bodies uh, at the end of their jaws that might uh, facilitate hearing. So successfully navigating these complex social relationships require quite a large brain to um, 
process all this de uh, detailed information on cooperation, uh, competition, as well as communication. And the, the brain of a sperm whale has been shown to be the largest brain of any man animal on the planet. It's about 60% larger than the brain of an elephant. And furthermore, the brains of tooth whales and dolphins are significantly larger than any of those of any other uh, non or any uh, non-human primates. And they're really second only to uh, human brains when they're measured with respect to body size as well. And there have been three peaks of um, brain size evolution in mammals, so including tooth whales, humans, as well as elephants. And uh, all of these have one thing in common, which is the uh, extreme mutual dependence based on uh, predatory threats, as well as uh, living within uh, these social groups. And it really has been quite an evolutionary puzzle um, why some animals have evolved quite large brains because they are so energetically expensive. So the benefits of having a large brain needs to outweigh the costs. So the human brain is about 2% of our body weight, but it takes up about 20% of our uh, energy. So moving on to um, sounds made by uh, baleen whales. So these are quite different. And first they want to talk about the songs of humpback whales. These are most, uh, probably the most impressive of the baleen whales. And these can be slightly higher frequency because humpback whales gather uh, in breeding grounds during the winter. So there's no need for that long distance propagation, these low frequency sounds produced by other baleen whales. Let's listen to a humpback whale song. So quite beautiful sounds. Um, and it's only the males that sing in humpback whales, so humpback whales' song is thought to have a similar function to that of birdsong, namely to attract females or uh, defend breeding grounds. Uh, and male songs are very long and complex, um, they, and they're shared at any point in time, they're shared by uh, all members in the population, so all members always sing the same song, which is slightly different to that of bird song, I believe, where uh, males may sing their own individual songs to impress females. And these songs can last, or easily last, 10 to 15 minutes, and they're repeated over and over again for hours. Um, so again, I find it quite difficult just to remember the lyrics of a song on the radio, which maybe last uh, three to four minutes but these whales are able to repeat these songs of 15 minutes without making any mistakes. And songs are composed of uh, themes, and within themes there are phrases, and within phrases uh, there are subphrases. That's not the clearest uh, picture there. And the structure of this song uh, changes over time, mostly during the winter when the whales are singing. So uh, they see, uh, we see changes in the frequency and duration of individual units within the song. Whales will delete certain uh, themes or phrases and then insert uh, new phrases. So by the end of a, a breeding season, uh, the song can be uh, substantially modified, but um, it's believed that it typically takes up to 15 years before a humpback whale song has changed completely within a population. However, uh, there was a, quite a neat study done of Australian humpback whales. So uh, between 1996 and 98, scientists in Australia observed a cultural revolution in humpback whale song. So around Australia, there are two populations, an East Coast and a West Coast population, and each sing their own individual song. But in 96, a couple of individuals from the West Coast population invaded the breeding grounds of the East Coast population. And within just two years, uh, the East Coast song was changed completely and all individuals were singing this cool new West Coast tune. <laughs> um, 
So, and the speed at which this happens suggests that uh, novelty really drives change in humpback whale song. So you can probably imagine getting quite tired of singing the same old song over and over and over again. Um, other baleen whales also make uh, quite intriguing sounds. So the largest mammals on Earth, the blue whale and the, the fin whale, produce very low frequency vocalizations. And these are the most powerful and ubiquitous biological sounds in our oceans. And these long and patterned vocal sequences of fin whales, for example, can reach intensities of about um, 185 decibels. So that's similar in loudness to a rock concert, for example. And these um, mammals need to call uh, long distances when it comes to attracting females because they don't aggregate in breeding grounds like the humpback whale. They tend to be quite solitary, oceanic animals, so these sounds need to travel uh, great distances to, to reach females. And this is what a fin whale call sounds like. not as complex as that of the calls of the humpback whales. So before we move on to the last part of the talk, um, which is about how um, us humans are having an impact on the acoustic world of marine mammals, I just want to make the point that our oceans are by no means silent. So if we take us out of the equation, there's still plenty of uh, noise in our oceans. So this idea of a silent ocean is really uh, a myth. Uh, our oceans are filled with geophysical noise as well as biological noise. So there's noise from earthquakes, noise generated from winds and waves and storms, and then biological noise as well from uh, uh, marine mammals, uh, as well as fish uh, and other species. So this slide here is uh, comparing the uh, impacts of humans on land uh, versus that in the ocean. So you've got time here in the middle, uh, which goes from about 50,000 years ago to 100 years in the future. And this red line is uh, present day. So the impact uh, humans have had in the ocean that this figure is kind of illustrating has been uh, less advanced even though we've been harvesting uh, the oceans for thousands of years. But it's really the more recent industrialization of this harvest that um, has had initiated an era of quite intensive marine wildlife declines. But it's not just removal or direct removal of marine wildlife from the oceans that uh, is an issue. So there's also been with some of these activities, a human invasion of the uh, underwater world. And underwater sounds are uh, generated by human activities. Um, and these can be divided into two different groups. So one where sound is essentially uh, a byproduct of some activity, and one where sound is used as a measurement tool. So dominant in the first category is uh, low frequency noise from vessels, including container ships, uh, fishing, public transport, uh, and recreational activities as well. So about 80% of global freight transport take, takes place uh, over water by motorized shipping. Another significant source in that first category is uh, noise that's associated with construction and uh, exploitation of offshore platforms. In the second category, uh, where noise, human noise is used as a measurement tool, uh, this involves sound used by navies, uh, as well as oil and gas industry, oceanographers and geologists. And the first time that sound was used by humans to uh, locate objects underwater was shortly after the Titanic sank in 1912. So the most pervasive um, of these human generated noise in the oceans is uh, by far shipping noise. 
So maritime traffic has, uh, on the world's oceans has increased fourfold over the last 20 years, so quite an astonishing uh, increase in recent time. So you can imagine, for example, being a marine mammal somewhere in the Atlantic or in the North Pacific, there's probably very rarely a time when you're, when you're not exposed to shipping noise. And I've got an example of what these whales are listening to on a regular basis. So quite a pervasive uh, background noise, and I'm having to shout already um, to be heard over it. So this, these figures here are uh, just illustrating the increase in numbers of vessels uh, on the um, world's oceans since the 1950s, so quite a significant increase of large vessels also a significant increase in the gross tonnage of these vessels. And as a result of that, we're also seeing increased sound levels in our oceans. These figures are from the North Pacific, uh, where there's been about a 10 decibel increase over the last approximately 30 years. So what's the problem? What's the, the big deal? You know, what's all the, the fuss about uh, with human noise in the oceans? Um, well, the noise produced by uh, human activities overlaps greatly with that of uh, many marine animals, including fish and marine mammals. For, and so here you can see uh, the frequency of, of human noise and how that overlaps with uh, many of these other animals. For marine mammals, uh, as this figure suggests, uh, one of the biggest issues is probably with baleen whales, where there's a great overlap uh, in human noise and, and the hearing range of, of baleen whales. Uh, odontocetes or tooth whales tend to produce higher frequency sounds that um, go above the frequency of these human generated noise. Oh, and the uh, ways in which the human noise is impacting marine mammal populations is through uh, changes in behavior. Uh, we see displacement from important foraging areas. Uh, often these important foraging areas is also where offshore developments are taking place. Uh, we've seen direct injury as well as hearing loss, which can be permanent or temporary. And you can probably imagine that any hearing loss is going to be quite detrimental to these animals that rely on sound so heavily. And also masking of uh, sounds is, is quite an issue which I'll talk about in a bit. So there are several studies that have reported uh, behavioural change in whales and dolphins in the proximity of boats um, or other human activities. And the typical observations that we see is a decrease in distance between individuals within a group, uh, an increase in speed, a change in direction away from the noise, uh, and the example here also a decrease in the probability that these animals are going to be foraging. So this is the probability of foraging when dolphins in particular forage, they produce these um, buses, which are uh, clicks that are located very, very uh, close in time. And as the number of boats are increasing, the probability that these animals are going to be foraging uh, reduces greatly. So you can probably imagine that in very uh, busy areas, the normal behavior of these animals is going to be interrupted uh, regularly. So we really do need to be quite conscientious about um, our activities while we're on the water. Uh, marine mammals, we'll probably hear boats approaching long before we see them. So once you've spotted a marine mammal, most likely their behavior will have changed already. So there's some evidence that marine mammals are able to adapt to increasing sound in the ocean. Uh, in this study of blue whales, the authors um, showed that during particularly noisy periods, in this example, during seismic surveys, these blue whales would increase their calling rates. They would call uh, more frequently compared to the more quieter periods where there was no seismic. So this may be a uh, compensatory behavior to elevated noise in the species. 
Um, so another concern, as I talked about briefly before, is masking. Uh, so masking is the lack of capability of any organism to detect crucial sounds as a result of increased background noise. So this is where these uh, animals are unable to detect uh, and interpret and even respond to biologically uh, crucial signals. And that can include uh, mating calls or offspring calls, as I showed in that slide of bottlenose dolphins that often use whistles, even prey sounds or uh, sounds by predators. So given the significant overlap between sounds generated by human activities and hearing ranges of marine mammals, uh, the concern is that there's quite great potential for uh, masking and reducing the communication space of these species. So take this example here, um, where a uh, whale or the communication space of a whale under ambient noise, so without human noise uh, being involved, the communication space or range of this whale is up to uh, a thousand kilometers. But introduce anthropogenic noise and the range of communication for this animal is suddenly uh, reduced down to about a thousand kilometers. So quite a significant reduction. And these are the typical uh, human noise levels that we see in the oceans. So this is a significant problem for whales that typically live quite solitary lives um, and need to potentially communicate across oceans. And as a result of increased shipping noise, uh, we've seen a 65% reduction in the communication space of North Atlantic right whales, which are these guys up here at the top. And uh, right whales are also an enda endangered species. Um, but we've also seen up to 87% reduction in communication space of other species. So this likely has uh, impacts on their populations if they're not able to find mates. And this problem is kind of enhanced by um, the um, great levels of, of whaling that have taken place. So in about 100 years, industrial whaling vessels uh, killed nearly 2.9 million whales of a variety of different species. Most were uh, fin whales and sperm whales, but uh, blue whales, sci whale, and humpback and minke whales were also taken in their thousands. And by some estimates, sperm whales may have been driven down to about one third of their initial population size. Blue whales may have been depleted uh, by up to 90%. So quite significant declines in these populations. There's some evidence that some populations are recovering, such as the minke whale. Um, but others, including the North Atlantic right whale and the Antarctic blue whale, probably now hover on the brink of extinction um, as a result of industrial whaling. So the point I want to make is that for these uh, species that are quite solitary anyway, uh, now that their populations are so greatly reduced, if we include uh, human generated noise and reducing their communication space, this is likely to have wider reaching impacts on their populations if they can't find mates in order to reproduce and sustain or even recover some of these populations. Uh, so some species have shown the ability to be able to adapt to living in an increasingly noisy environment. Uh, so some small songbirds have shown the ability to increase the frequency of their calls in noisy urban environments. So they've simply shifted the frequency of their uh, calls outside of the noise band in order to uh, be able to better communicate. And that's what this uh, figure up here is showing. I can't reach it. Um, but you can see F min, which is the minimum frequency of the call in uh, nine non uh, noisy periods. The middle bit here is an illustration of uh, urban noise and during busy period that minimum frequency is shifted upwards and out of that noise band. So as I mentioned before, song um, in uh, some baleen whales serve a similar function to that of bird song and uh, that's namely to attract or attract mates or 
Pell uh, competitors. And in populations of right whales, we've also seen the ability of these whales to increase the frequency of their calls to probably better uh, be, heard, uh, be heard. So in this study, they compared the starting frequency of calls from the 1970s and 1950s to that of uh, 2000. And there was a significant shift upwards in the starting frequency of these calls. Also quite a significant uh, difference between the North Atlantic right whale and the southern right whale, indicating that these animals may be living in uh, noisier environments. So this shift in frequency may help maintain the communication range uh, of this species during periods of increased noise. Um, this is quite a concern for North Atlantic right whale. They're down to about 430 individuals, uh, of which about 100 are estimated to be uh, breeding females. And this is an example of a right whale call. It's quite short, we'll play that again. So as well as some adaptive responses to increased human noise, there's also evidence that noise uh, results in a reduction in the information contacts, a content of uh, some of these signals. Uh, and in this example here, uh, in this study, they showed a dolphin whistle under uh, low ambient noise, compared that to the dolphin whistle in high ambient noise, uh, which demonstrated this reduction in information content in this call. And that can be a significant consequence to some of these more highly social species that use quite advanced communication, so they need to portray more than uh, just their presence uh, compared to uh, similar to that of uh, some of the baleen whales that uh, communicate over longer distances. This was a very interesting study. Uh, the events of 9-11 actually revealed chronic stress in right whales. So following 9-11, there was a significant reduction in underwater noise um, due to a short-term reduction in shipping. So as you probably remember, everything kind of came to a halt after 9-11. And uh, feces collected from right whales during this quieter period were compared to hormones collected in feces uh, during the following normal years where shipping levels were back up to normal. And this revealed significant uh, reduction in stress hormones during these quieter periods following 9-11. Uh, so you may also ask yourself, how do you go out and find whale poo? But that's a different story. Uh, so this was the first evidence uh, that exposure to low frequency shipping noise may be associated with chronic stress in these whales. And it has implications for all baleen whales that live in uh, very busy areas, as well as for the recovery uh, of this endangered right whale population. So these whales are calling more often, they're calling louder, and now we also see evidence of stress in some of these species. So you might compare that to sitting in a, a noisy restaurant one evening, having to raise your voice in order to be able to have a conversation, except these whales are having to do that all the time, pretty much. Uh, in humans, we've also started to document the impacts of uh, noise pollution on our health. So that can be both mental as well as uh, physical, and it's also been shown to disrupt learning in children. So both road noise and aircraft noise has been shown to increase the risk of high blood pressure and heart attacks in humans. So it's probably no wonder that we're seeing some of these similar uh, stress symptoms in these whales. And there are also cases where uh, human noise has caused direct injury on marine mammals, so mid-frequency active uh, sonar used by Navy vessels uh, are likely causing some species to cover uh, similar symptoms to that of decompression sickness in humans. So beaked whales in particular have been shown to repeatedly strand um, a few hours or days after naval exercises where military ships have used uh, mid-frequency active sonar. And consistently in all these uh, stranded animals, 
they showed the same kind of symptoms uh, similar to that of decompression sickness, so quite extensive internal injuries. And the beaked whale is also, interestingly, one of the deepest diving, or the deepest diving marine mammals. They easily dive down to nearly two kilometers depth. So there are great concerns already for marine mammals, um, particularly uh, when it comes to whales and dolphins. So this figure here is illustrating that uh, over here you've got the percentage of species. So for cetaceans, which is this bar here, most cetaceans in this, well, not most cetaceans, but uh, this red part of the bar here is showing that this is the percentage of species that are endangered. And this little yellow bit here is the percentage that are extinct. But I think much more worryingly, most of this uh, bar for cetaceans is gray, which means these species are data deficient. So there's still uh, quite basic or crucial data that we're missing uh, for some of these species, such as just their uh, population size and let alone uh, having an understanding of what impacts our activities have on them. So just to finish, uh, finish up, I wanted to highlight this uh, new, quite exciting study that just came out uh, this year, where they analyzed uh, stress hormones in earwax of baleen whales. So as I mentioned before, these, the ear canals of baleen whales are essentially plugged with earwax that looks something like that. Uh, and earwax contains growth layers, so similar to what we see in the uh, growth rings in trees. So you can use earwax, or these growth layers in earwax, to estimate how old the animal is. And if you know how old the whale was when it died, you can then backtrack and look at stress levels over the entire lifetime of this animal and when that stress occurred. Uh, so this study found very high correlations between uh, stress, which is this black line in whales. So going back in time, back to the, even back to the 1870s. And they correlated that with uh, the number of whales that were taken by industrial whaling. And you can see easily that these two lines, the blue and the black line, are following a very similar pattern. So it's now been shown that during industrial whaling, stress in these animals uh, was elevated. And you can also see very clear dips. So during World War II, uh, when whaling uh, was quite heavily reduced, we also see a reduction in stress in these animals. Um, in 1972 is when the Marine Mammal Protection Act was uh, implemented in the US. And again, because of that, see quite a dip in numbers of uh, whales taken by uh, whaling ships, as well as a uh, quite steep decline in stress levels as well. So what does this have to do with sound at all? Well, um, I think it would now be possible to also use these earplugs and look at these stress hormones uh, to try and understand more longer term poten potential stress in these animals uh, as human noise continues to increase in the oceans. Uh, so there's still, just to finish off, this is the last slide, uh, there's still so much we don't know uh, about these animals and about how they interact with their environment. Uh, for several species, we lack the most basic data, which is simply, or as you may call, simply a population estimate. Um, the species we have the best uh, estimates for, at least for the, for the large whales, are those that were particularly depleted during industrial whaling. Uh, but we still also have very poor understanding uh, of their hearing thresholds and when human noise becomes an issue. A lot of the information we've gathered is from uh, captive animals uh, and obviously these involves, uh, involve uh, most of the, the smaller uh, dolphins uh, and porpoises maybe in some cases as well. Not really feasible for, for the bigger whales. And another important point to make um, here at the end is that sound doesn't obey barriers. So we may establish protected areas for these species, uh, 
but sound is not gonna obey these barriers, similar to that of pollutants in the oceans. So uh, these are still gonna encroach. So I think it's crucial that we continue to protect the acoustics of our oceans in order to conserve uh, and manage some of these uh, marine mammal populations. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming uh, and thank you all for listening to this talk.